What does it mean to have agency, authority and autonomy? It means to know who you are. There's a saying among historians, Anonymous was a woman. Well, I hope because of the work of the Feminist Institute, Anonymous will have a name. The Feminist Institute's mission is to make visible the invisible. We are digitizing archives from the 1960s until now, working in conjunction with the innovators of those archives and institutions that hold them. One of the things that is important to me as an archivist is taking those riches from the physical archive, the things that have been well preserved, so that we can digitize them properly and spread the word about our history, especially women's history. For too long, a sexist and misogynistic apparatus has been in charge of women's stories. And we at the Feminist Institute are taking power back. Welcome everybody. My name is Carly Graham Garcia. I'm the executive director of the Feliciano Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Montclair State University and welcome to weekly women entrepreneurship. Today I am privileged to be joined by Kathy Landy, the founder of the Feminist Institute. Kathy, welcome. Hi Carly, thanks for having us. So it's tell perfect. us first, what is the Feminist Institute? Well, the Feminist Institute is a not-for-profit organization dedicated to collecting, digitizing, and sharing the rich history of feminist art, humanities, politics, business, and making our archive globally accessible for free. Wow. So when you began the Institute, I mean, what problem are you solving for? Well, this work, um, whether it's fine art, media, literature, or politics, doesn't live in a central digital repository. The innovators of this work are aging and will soon be incapable of telling their stories. So students don't have access to these important works, nor to the context in which they were created. Um, there exists a historic inequality between the genders, which is why even in 2020, we still have voices and stories that are forgotten. And we aim to establish this comprehensive cross-disciplinary digital archive of materials by leading feminist thinkers anchoring our local histories into a national initiative that solidifies our cultural contributions, past, present, and future. Particularly in this moment in time, if it is online, it isn't visible. Wow, and so that leads me actually to, to ask you specifically about the mission of the Institute. When you and I first met and I first learned about the Feminist Institute and the digitization that you were doing that you just described, I was wowed. I wasn't aware that you had really honed in on quite a powerful mission statement, which is, and I'm gonna read, make visible the invisible. So tell us more about what that actually means and, and can you give us an example of maybe a particular piece of feminist work that you just brought to the light with digitization? Sure. Um, in 2020, when one's work and voice and story isn't digitized, it's forgotten, silenced, and made invisible. The Feminist Institute is capitalizing on the mass dissemination of online search and technology and offers us to advance the march of feminism and achieve greater equalization through digitization. While we were working now to complete that Mary Beth Edelson loft archive that we started with you, we're converting those 30,000 files into searchable data. And we've also taken time during this stay at home moment to illuminate several advances made by women since the 1960s that were overlooked. It's quiet work. Um, social media also is a terrific way to do that too. And you don't even need a scanning machine to do that. Um, for example, Dr. Phyllis Ann Wallace, she was the first woman to receive a doctorate of economics at Yale, and she was a top seniority um, staff at the Equal Opportunity, um, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and she was critical to that anti-discrimination contingencies of the Civil Rights Acts of 1964. So we did a little feature on her, um, as, and that's social media, very easy to kind of get out there. And as long as we've mentioned Yale, there was a research there, researcher there in 1968, Vivian Perlis, and she began the project of, um, she had a mission of recording voices of American composers. Um, so this comes full circle, even when we can highlight the work of innovative archivists. That's, you know, that's pretty spectacular. We can actually innovate the folks who are doing the highlighting. 
So it's women lifting up the voices of other women, and now we're all working together. Wow, that's huge. You mentioned Mary Beth Edelson. It was a tremendous afternoon when, that we spent together, basically walking back in time uh, into her studio in Soho when I got the chance to do that with you. And first of all, it's the most amazing New York City apartment uh, I've ever been in, definitely the largest. And to your point, it was like walking into history because so much of her work was still there and you and your team had the chance to capture it and make it viewable for others, um, which is tremendous. So then, so then Kathy, where, when did you first get this idea? I mean, you haven't always been an entrepreneur, um, but you came up with this amazing concept that sort of has this endless mission, right? You could continue doing this for forever. Yeah. Um, you know, where did you get this idea and kind of what in your background brought you to this place of becoming a founder? Well, I was a scholarship kid in college and I was trying to write a paper on some of the feminist artists on the West Coast. And I was focusing on correspondence between two of the instigators of that feminist art movement and one of them being Judy Chicago. Um, I couldn't access the information because it was housed in archives at various universities and I didn't have the funds to travel to those universities to open the boxes and complete my research. So fast forwarding to now, Many of those important documents still haven't been digitized, while the archives of equally important male artists have been. Um, this started as a personal story, which is now, frankly, the story for all of us. Um, we can't travel. Um, I look for solutions to challenges, particularly when it comes to inequities in educational positioning. Uh, everyone should have the same advantage when doing research, equal access, right? Um, so it was really just my own experience. I identified an urgent need and we realized that there was a simple solution. Wow. We are now acquiring access to archives of feminist practice, cataloging them, digitizing them, and providing access to the information in a free cloud-based platform. We then hold cultural events um, to promote all this work in order to share the rich histories in collaboration with the actual practitioners if they're still alive. It's critical to do this documentation while many of the innovators are still alive and with us so that they can be part of their own legacy. Um, so digitizing this material will allow someone in say, Australia and Idaho to research and create their own movements and maybe even communicate with each other and then create an associated community. And especially during this time when travel is restricted, it's really important that we pull this together. Wow. Now, accessing this information for free. So let's talk a little bit about funding and funding your business idea or nonprofit idea in this case. We talk a lot at the Entrepreneurship Center here at Montclair State about lack of access to funding and venture capital money for women entrepreneurs. Um, Fortune always does a study every year. I think in 2019, women received less than 3% of venture capital funding um, of the entire pie. So tell us a little bit about how you're funded and what sort of the model is for sustaining this business idea ongoing. Well, we're going funder by funder. We started with a small circle of key supporters and listed the board to assist in funding search and applied to foundations with an interest in equalizing the playing field and data search. It's slow, but we're working with libraries and their archivists on staff. Everyone is a partner on this meaning that this lift is shared, especially if the innovator is still alive and we could move faster and capture personal narratives that contribute to the important digital legacy. But as we're going, we're developing relationships with various institutions who are really excited about what we're doing and would like to have eyeballs on our holdings too. Um, you know, I, I kind of feel like this has been a lifelong, um, challenge of mine um, before I, I did this. I, I mean, I've always been involved academically in the arts, working for galleries and magazines. Um, I, owned, I owned a gallery too that championed the work of undervalued, underrecognized feminist artists. And, and they often functioned as po poetic activists as well. I mean, you remember Karen Finley, um, she was part of the NEA4, she was in our gallery. Tanya Bruguera, she's, um, routinely incarcerated in Havana. So she was also part of our gallery. And even Yana Sturbeck, remember that neat dress? That mm -hmm. was terrific. Um, and so I can, money would come in from a sale on that. And we ended up, you know, on a shoestring putting together an amazing exhibit. But you know, it was a labor of love. You had to pay the artist 
And then um, we had to pay for keeping the lights on and their production of the artwork. So it, that ran like a nonprofit. Um, without the tax benefit, right? But um, <laughs> but, but, but the spirit is the same in what we're doing now um, with the Feminist Institute, except that now our mission is larger in scope and inclusive of all institutional holdings that would like to join. And and now the Feminist Institute's mission is concretized as we all find ourselves unable to travel or do analog research. So it's really important that feminist assets must be digital in order to be searchable. Yeah, for sure. Um, you sent me a note the other day, I'm part of your database and your mailing list, about your personal digital archiving project. That struck me as so unique, especially in this moment, and really in a, a very on-brand extension of the work you're trying to do. Tell us more about the personal digital archiving project. Okay. Um, personal archiving is inherently a feminist act because as women, we have to save and record our own stories in order to document our contributions to culture and history. The idea for this project was sparked amid the stay-at-home orders, mm -hmm. um, as many people were spending their downtime going through their own collections of photographs and documents. I mean, you've all you've seen that online, people pulling out old photographs. Um, we thought the project would be a great way to engage the audience and teach them with the help of our digital archivists. Um, the importance of properly preserving personal items. Mm. So along with giving people the tools, they need to maintain their collections um, and also getting um, more of a, a base um, of supporters and, and pulling together um, folks who would like to be part of our group. We're launching a series of IGTV interviews with notable feminists about their own personal archiving journeys and our first IGTV of the series kicks off the Gloria Steinem interview. Pretty powerful. That's a good start. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. And then, so, okay, so we're going to tune in and watch that and see what happens next. Um, you know, in talking with a lot of uh, the founders of businesses, we talk a lot about identifying your customer. It seems to me that, you know, especially given your mission, the people who can consume the work that you're digitizing, it's endless, right? It's men, it's women, it's young people, it's old people. But as you think about growing the Feminist Institute, who do you think about being your customers? How do you kind of tackle that question and then in turn grow that base of people interested in your work? Mm -hmm. um, our target market exists on three levels. We've got students, donors, and innovators. For students, any student at any level who is interested in understanding the context of feminist thought leaders in various disciplines throughout history. For donors, all men and women who are interested in preserving this work and making it accessible for all. And for innovators, we wanna catalog your work or your experience and place it in a historical context. Wow, that makes a ton of sense. Um, and then for innovators, and also thinking about what you mentioned before about partnerships with colleges and universities, mm -hmm. when you and I first met, you, um, you, know, you were engaged in a lot of dialogue with CUNY and other institutions digitizing their collections. Why are colleges and universities important partners? And how do you kind of fit them into the mix that you just talked about? You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're in some ways sort of part of the customer, part of the audience that you just yeah. described. Tell us a little bit more about colleges and universities. Well, um, libraries throughout the world hold the personal papers and other documentations from important women throughout history, um, but there's currently no database that links them together and allows curious students to uncover the work of women who have forged new paths in art, government, humanities, and other sectors. So TFI's digital archive um, will allow the work of these significant cultural leaders to reach the broadest po possible audience. So the latest scanning technology and online presentation would allow us to capture letters, papers, photographs, and other ephemera from feminist workspaces and make them available online to a global audience. So, so a lot of these relationships with the partners come through the support of our amazing board. Many of, of the folks on our board um, have uh, gone to those universities. Um, and we're also finding folks, folks are coming to us in a, in a time of spirit of collaboration. They're saying, how can we help each other? This is a unique moment 
in our history as a nation. We're all coming together to try and make a difference rather than holding the cards very close to the chest and being proprietary about information that can help other people and each other. People are reaching out to us saying, let's get this done now. Uh, we need to make some change and let's work together to make it happen faster. The universities are very interested in that sort of thing because they don't have the technology. Um, and the, so what's exciting is that the idea of feminism has changed over time, becoming more inclusive um, perhaps than it was in the 60s. Um, so that's why we're capturing it from the 60s until now. We're seeing a moment of coming together across the disciplines in tech, finance, and the arts. And we're building a new language around that. And that's really exciting. Wow, that's great. And it's really helpful to understand that. And now that I'm actually working in academia, um, I had no idea that universities own such huge repositories of art and artifacts. Makes sense, right? With libraries, you understand it. I've been amazed just in, even in my limited time at Montclair State to see sort of um, how much great stuff there is to be curated that's not on display for public eye. Um, so I understand why they're a critical part of sort of the digitization strategy to be able to bring to light a lot of these important works. Um, okay, so Kathy, I can't, I can't not ask a question about music because you are such a music buff and those of you who have been on the feminine website or seen uh, the types of events that Kathy works on, they are very often anchored in music. So tell us a little bit about how that plays a role in what you do. Um, and then, you know, how has it also helped with fundraising? Because I think there's a component here that you've really brought into your work that's helped build awareness of what you're doing, but also raising additional funds. Well, um, as an organization devoted to illuminating feminist contributions to culture, the Feminist Institute is galvanized by the way rock music has been at the forefront of feminist activism. Um, the concert we organized for Planned Parenthood, which was due to take place on March 14th, was a way to tell that story and stand up for reproductive rights. Um, there's always been um, activism in music and it's generally led by a pack of women, a pack of feminists pulling it together. We included for this concert, one of the most influential rock voices of our generation was Courtney Love. And she's always projected an electric independence for women and embrace the word feminism from the very start. She's like original, rebellious, creative, and equal. Um, I mean, she's just like, you know, feminism. We meant it the first time, you know? I mean, she's just <laughs> right there. So, so for me, I mean, it's also part of my personal history why we're, why we're also involved in, um, in music and, and kind of cataloging um, the activism associated with that. Um, I, I'm just, uh, a punk rocker from the East Village. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's great. That's great. Okay, so I have, I have two more questions because we've taken a lot of your time. I also want to make sure that we give um, you a chance to tell us where to find the Feminist Institute, mm -hmm. your website, and also social handles. Um, but before I ask you that, tell me, so, so what's the future of this brand? I mean, where do you hope the Feminist Institute goes next? Well, the Feminist Institute is building a digital archiving lab for the purposes of, of creating a dedicated archiving la laboratory with state-of-the-art scanning equipment and archiving software. The 2020 New York City budget has earmarked a capital grant for the procurement of digital archiving equipment to be housed in partnership with the Digital Humanities Department at CUNY Graduate Center. So this digital lab at CUNY will provide an invaluable resource for faculty and student digital culture projects, as well as archiving initiatives throughout the Graduate Center. The lab will also facilitate the Feminist Institute's new work in digitizing archival content, creating related programming and producing content for our eventual online platform. So aggregated materials and the growth of the collection will be openly accessible to public audience, as well as researchers and students. So the aim of the, of the platform that we are developing will work with existing archives as well as our own collections to make them accessible in an easy web-based search. So we're not ready to launch this platform yet. Our target is spring 2021. Ultimately, the vision is to create a single portal to feminist work that has already been digitized or will be by our partners, as well as many unique archives and collections to which TFI is gaining access. It's key that the digitization of the new materials is done so that they are easily captured by existing web search engines. I mean, you, you know this, Carl, we've been talking about this for a really long time. Yeah. So 
I mean, basically, I mean, we go back to our mission at the Feminist Institute, our particular piece of the fight for gender equality comes primarily in our efforts to make visible the work of women the way men's work has been more consistently visible. There's work to, to do and being done towards equality along other lines too, but you know, ours focuses on the gender gap. For example, um, it, it just, for example, Shirley Chisholm's legacy, I think we've talked about this too, uh, seems to be experiencing renewed interest. Her documentarian serves on our board and is an example of someone who relied on an as yet digi digitized archive to tell the story that needed to be telling. Or take Muriel Siebert. She was the first woman to hold a seat on the New York Stock Exchange, right? So I think about how hard she's had to fight to get to that moment and kind of touch the glass ceiling. And I even wonder if my daughters will know who she is. Mm. So the Feminist Institute creates digital content featuring women and a vehicle to get it, get to it so that going forward, we can make sure that the next kid doing graduate research on a shoestring like me can utilize this information, build on it, draw strength and energy from it to create new scholarship and innovation, which of course we would love to publish and support. Yeah, that's huge. So you mentioned this um, portal, just take a moment if you would, tell our listeners where to find the Feminist Institute, your website, and then also social handles. Yeah, you can go to um, thefeministinstitute.org. You can go um, onto uh, Instagram at the Feminist Institute. Um, and let's see, also on Facebook, you can find us uh, and Twitter. We're, we're on all of them. <laughs> Okay, good. I'm and sure there will be more in 10 years. <laughs> there, there will be. <laughs> um, okay, last question for you. Thank you so much for, for telling us your story and, to, and, and really sort of embracing this really ambitious mission that you're on and for securing, you know, earmarked funding in the New York City budget. That is no small feat. So that's tremendous. And we wish you luck with CUNY. Um, so give our entrepreneurs who maybe are listening in and have have a nugget of an idea like you had many years ago around this. Um, what are some of the do's and don'ts? If you could kind of go back in time and say, gosh, I wish I had known this or I wish I had done that, you know, what would that advice be for our community? Um, all right. Well, when you have a passion, you should always lead with that. It will showcase the integrity of your mission and will further your vision without dilutions from competing agendas. Just go with the passion. Um, another nugget of advice, don't get distracted by opportunities that not, are not in line with that vision. As exciting as they may be, they will not lead your organization to achieve the goals that formed it. Um, if I could start over, I wouldn't get so distracted with some of the high profile projects that ca never came to fruition because frankly, they weren't really within our mission. Mm. Uh, another nugget of advice, when you get an idea, say it out loud. The best strategy lies in articulating conviction. And the last piece of advice is if you have a voice, use it. People will listen. And if you have the power to elevate a female voice, do it. Wow. Very powerful advice and messaging. Kathy Landy, founder of the Feminist Institute, thanks for being with us. Thank you so much.